Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Uh, we are in the middle of the week. Um, pray you all have had a productive week thus far. Um, things have been interesting on our end. We had a um, tragic situation in our ministry. Uh, one of our deacons uh, passed away on Sunday morning. So we've been picking up the pieces. Right? We're grateful um, to know that he's with the Lord. But um, there's some emotional things and a grieving process that we have to go through. And so we are, we're, we're going through that right now. Um, but God is faithful. God is still good. Um, I'm going to get right into, uh, the word on this morning. Um, and we're going to kind of just hover around Acts chapter nine. Uh, we, we opened Monday and we were discussing forgiveness and we, um, dealt with forgiveness of another person. Um, there was a situation in the church in Corinth uh, where a man uh, committed um, sin and he was unrepentant. And because of that, they removed him from the church. And the time came where he wanted to be restored and reconciled back to the church. And Paul told them that I need you to forgive him um, or we'll be outsmarted by Satan's devices. Paul was letting us know then that one of the many tricks that Satan will use is unforgiveness, right? Holding a grudge. And we established the fact that um, sometimes holding a grudge is, uh, well, usually holding a grudge is, is uh, kind of a misnomer because you're not holding a grudge. The grudge is actually holding you. And so we encourage you to let it go because unforgiveness, that grudge turns into bitterness. And that grudge is a hindrance between you and God. And you're unable to, um, the Father's not going to, it doesn't hear our prayers when we don't forgive other people. So we established that now today, though, is a little bit different. I want to deal with forgiveness, but as it pertains to forgiving ourselves, right? <clears throat> it's interesting that um, we we can we can really uh, beat ourselves up for the things that we've done. Um, we can um, celebrate God for giving everyone else, all right? When it comes to some of the things that we've done, um, some of the things that we do, right? Let's just be honest. Uh, we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. And then on the flip side, I find it interesting um, that... Uh, when it comes to, you know, our life and, and, and our mistakes, that uh, people can forgive everyone else except for us, right? Maybe you've been there where um, you've seen people get forgiven and restored. And when it came to your turn, right, uh, people just wanted to continue to bring up your past as opposed to celebrate the fact that you're trying to become this new creation that Christ said that you would be. And so I, the only parallel I have to discuss that is, is uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, we know him and we love his writings. And I would say 65% of the New Testament was written by him. Um, and so his writings are um, integral to the church today. Uh, the church today, uh, we govern ourselves and, um, and we operate and we function um, largely in large part by his writings, the things that he wrote to the churches in, in the New Testament. But he wasn't always this believer. He wasn't always this person that um, loved the Lord. He wasn't always this person that encouraged people to follow Christ. He was a person who um, persecuted those of us that believed in the Lord. Um, and so Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 11, it says, The Lord said, Go over the straight street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him. So he can see again. So this this is the the uh, setup. Acts chapter seven, six, Acts chapter six and seven. Uh, Paul is persecuting Christians. Um, Acts chapter eight, he has an encounter with God. He's knocked off his beast, and from that moment, um, he's now no longer persecuting Christians. He's now trying to find out, you know, what this what what this light is. What what's this what's this voice that's speaking to me? And so, in preparation for him to turn from persecutor to one who's now a disciple, from persecutor to one who's now going to follow Christ, he has to go uh, to this man named Ananias. He has to go to his home because Ananias is going to pray for him, right? Paul was blinded by the light in Acts chapter 8, and so Ananias is going to lay hands on him. Uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he'd be able to see again. And so the Bible says that when the Lord told Ananias, he says, he, there's this man named Paul, and he's coming to your house, all right? Uh, show him a vision. He's going to come to you. You're going to lay hands on him. And Ananias immediately says, but Lord, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Now, what I want to take away from that is 
here it is a situation where you've been called um, out of darkness. You've been called out of a life of sin. You've been called out of a life of corruption and, and um, unethical behavior, however you want to put it. And God is calling you um, to do something great. And the first person you encounter wants to remind you of your past or wants to hold you accountable to your past. That's a very hurtful feeling, right? When you walk in church or you walk in Bible study or you walk into a family reunion or wherever you walk into and you're no longer the person that you used to be, but they stare at you um, based off of what they heard about you. Now, this is interesting because Ananias says, I've heard many people talk about him. So he had no firsthand encounters with, with Saul at all. He just heard many people talk. And maybe that's you. I know that was me when I when I uh, first got saved and got saved for real. Right. Um, and then uh, got married and, and uh, moved us back to the desert where I'm from. I'm from here and planted the ministry. And it was just amazing. Um, the Bible says Jesus through Jesus ministry that a prophet's not received in his own hometown. It was amazing how uh, when we planted the ministry. Um, so many people were saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to. You know, Pastor Keith, Pastor Shepherd said a church. Keefeon? Oh, yeah, I know him. I, you know, I heard plenty of things about him. And if we're honest, everything they heard is not a lie, right? If we're honest, part of, and I remember I said, um, there's there's no um, uh, uh, there's no uh, deliverance when you're still in denial, right? So if we're honest, yeah, some of the things that they heard, we did, right? But Ananias in this particular text, just like some of the people that talk about you, they weren't there. They they don't have any firsthand experiences about you. They just heard through the grapevine and through the gossip line who you were. And instead of being adult and mature Christians and 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 forming opinions off people off of experiences, well, sometimes we tend to form opinions off of what we've heard people say about people, right? And so here it is. Uh, he says he says I've heard him and I've heard about him and all that. So then if you jump down to Acts chapter nine verse nineteen, it says Saul stayed with the believers. And the masses for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues. Verse two, one, all who were made, all who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such, de such devastation among Jews, Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? They asked, and did he come here to arrest them and take them in chains into the leading priests? So this is another situation where Ananias lays hands on him, and his, his his sight is restored, and now he's preaching, and he's preaching the Bible, he's preaching the gospel, souls are being saved, and immediately. Um, all who heard him were amazed. They were amazed that he that this at this preaching. But then they were also amazed that God used somebody who was a persecutor of Christians, somebody who was the lowest of the low. Right? They were amazed that God could turn that around. And that's an encouragement for you because that says that regardless of what you did to transgress God, God is able to take all of that and use it to push you in the ministry if you just submit it to Him. Right? No matter what you've done. Now, here's the thing. I, I, we've all done some things. We've, we've all, and, 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 you know, we can go down the laundry list of things that we've done. And sometimes you play those Facebook games where it says, add up the total number of things that you've done in this list. And, you know, $3 if you've ever smoked a joint and $8 if you've ever stolen a car and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I'm afraid to give my total because, first of all, I need a calculator. And second of all, um, people, will, people will start to look at you funny. What? The bishop did that? that? Yeah, the bishop ain't always been saved, okay? And so people will be amazed when they know your testimony, right? Because they, they, they're like, wait a minute, I know what you used to do. And so that's why you can't be ashamed of your past. You got to be willing to tell people, I did this, I used to do this, and God delivered me. Why do you need to tell people that? Two, two reasons. One, you need to tell them because that shows the power of the Holy Spirit. He can turn you around, right? But then two, it's an encouragement to them. Because if they can see that God saved you from a life of drug addiction, then surely he can save them as well, right? And But then this is the other part that really bothered me, though. Um, in Acts chapter 21, it says they were amazed at the fact that he was preaching because they knew where he came from. But then if you go on to verse 21, it says, and didn't he come here to arrest them and take them and change to the leading priest? That bothers me in a sense, because here it is. You get saved and you're starting to serve the Lord. It's one thing for people to be amazed at the fact that God turns you around, but it's abusive. It can cause trauma spiritually. For those same people to turn around and say, yeah, and then start reading down your laundry list of dirt and the things that you've done. Church, we have to get better. All right? We have to be better than that. We have to be better. We don't need to beat people up with their past because we don't want people beating us up with our past. Right. OK, so it's amazing that everyone can be forgiven except for certain people like us. Right. Certain people, they, they'll forgive everybody else but you. Paul has just gotten saved and he now is going he's going through this process of sanctification. Right. 
John MacArthur, um, I don't agree with everything that he that he writes and that he says, but when it comes to, when it comes to being saved and this process of sanctification, he said there's a few different steps. There's co there's co cognition. That means aware. You're now aware of the fact spiritually that God is real and he wants you. He wants to pull you into service. And then there's conviction, right? Conviction happens when you read a scripture and you hear the word and you say, ouch. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is sharp like a two-edged sword. It cuts, you know, it just cuts, right? So you have cognition where you just, okay, God is real. I had an encounter like Saul did in Acts chapter 8. And then there's conviction where the word just convicts you, he said. And then there's affection. You get into affection when you start to realize how how merciful God has been, how unworthy we are, right? Affection, you literally just start to fall in love with him. And have you ever had that experience where you're just in your car and you're driving and you just start to think about all the things that God spared you from? Um, think about all the things that you did that were just ignorant and then just realize yet and still he still loves you, right? Loves you enough to to save your soul and call you in this. I mean, you just fall in love with him, right? And and, and if you look at it, um, Romans 5 and 8, it says, God showed his love for us while we were yet sinners. He Christ died for us. And he showed us his love while we were still sinners, while we didn't believe, while we didn't receive him. And he still died for us. When you think about that, you're like, wow, you can't help but have that affection, right? So John so John MacArthur said that there's cognition, that, you, that means you're aware. You're now aware that you were a sinner and now you're trying to walk with God. Yeah, you, God has your attention. And then there's conviction, right? There, there. Can I, can I, can I, can I help us here? There, there is no growth without conviction, right? There is no growth without conviction. If you go to church every Sunday and you sit there and you're not convicted by anything, I hate to tell you, but you might need to find another church. If you read the Bible throughout throughout the week and you're not, you're not, and you're, and you're skipping over the things that can, can convict you, you're not growing, right? Conviction. There is no growth there. And if you want to grow in God, you got to go through that circumcision process where things have to get cut away. It hurts. It's painful. But it, it's convicting, but it's necessary. Okay. And then he says there's affection. You start to fall in love with God. As 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 things get removed out of your life and pruned, then then he starts adding um, more of himself to your life. You start to fall more and more in love. And this is what it looks like. I used to be in love with um, money, right? I used to be in love with money. And as he circumcised that love for money away from me. Then I started to be replaced with love for him. Okay, um, and so I and and, and so um, well, let me deal with this. Uh, there's a teaching that says that Saul's name was changed to Paul. That's not the case. I know I taught it before. I, I came up at the Church of God in Christ, and that was a sermon. The sermon was. Saul had an encounter with God and God knocked him off his beast. And then when he got saved and the, and the scales came off his eyes, his name was now Paul. And now he's preaching the gospel. All right. That's not the case in scripture. Um, Saul was his Hebrew name, right? But Paul was his, it was, was his name, but it was a Greek name, right? And I'm going to show you in scripture in Acts chapter 13, um, him and Barnabas were commissioned. And there was a situation where they ran into a sorcerer. Verse nine says, uh, he's confronting a sorcerer. Acts chapter 13, verse nine, it says, Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he looked the sorcerer in the eye and he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort. In that day, it was common um, to uh, have a Hebrew surname. Okay. So when I say Paul, Saul, they're the same person. Um, his name wasn't changed to Paul. He, um, he the, the Bible references him as both. Okay. Just, just want to make sure. All right. So this is how you got it. This is how you get to where Paul was, right? This is how you get to where Paul was. First of all, um, now, now when I say get to where Paul was, I'm saying this is how you get to, how you graduate to being able to move from where you were and who you were into who God has called you to be. Okay. Um, First off, you have to forgive yourself. Now, understand that you've already been forgiven for God because you've had the encounter, right? You've repented. You've had the encounter. Again, cognition, as John MacArthur said it. You are now aware that God is calling you. And conviction, you're now aware of the fact that you've been living in sin. And you're saying, I surrender. And then you have that affection. Okay, so now that part is done. You and God are good. Okay, now it's you have to make resolution with you. You need to forgive yourself. Isaiah 43 and 18 it says, um, before he gets into uh, verse 19, he says, I'll do a new thing. He says, remember not the former thing, nor consider things of old. Now, contextually, he was talking about their deliverance. But I look at this scripture and I look at it here in terms of um, the life that you had pales in comparison to the life that I'm going to give you because I came to give you abundant life. Right. So I need you not to remember the old thing. And why don't I, why don't I want to uh, dwell on the old things? Because Satan tries to make you believe that life was so much better before you got serious about God. I, I, I And it's amazing because some Sundays I get fed up with the church. 
Um, this is nothing new. <laughs> Some weeks I get fed up with, with I, and I fed up necessarily with people, but fed up with drama. Because I just want to lead the way God called me to lead. I really just want to point people to the cross. I really don't, you know, the strife and all that. And I know it's part of the church because, and here, let me sidebar. If you are frustrated because drama is in the church and you think that drama is only in the church because the church is corrupt in 2021, I need you to go back and I need you to read Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians. The drama has been in the church from day one. And then, then read Revelation chapter uh, two through four. It'll show you that drama is in the church at the end as well. Okay, so please don't let drama take you away from the church. Don't let messy people take you away from the church. Don't let gossiping people take you away from the church because they're going to be here. They were here at the beginning. They're going to be here at the end in Revelation. So they were here when, when, the, when the church uh, launched in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell. And that's what we know the first church as. If you keep reading the book of Acts, drama hit the church. So from Acts to all of Paul's writings in the New Testament to where we are now, which is present to the future in Revelation, there's going to be drama in the church. You can't avoid it. It's just it's, it's been foretold. So how do you deal with it? Just don't get involved. Right? Just just don't get involved. It's very simple. If I go to Walmart right now and um, I'm going in there to get some batteries and a fight breaks out in produce, I'm going to get my batteries and I'm getting up out of there. I'm in Walmart. There's drama in Walmart, but I'm choosing not to get involved. I'm going in there for what I need. I'm dropping off what I need to give and I'm leaving. I'm going home. Right. That's how you avoid drama in the church. I thought I helped you with that. OK, so make resolution with your past. Here it is. They knew his rap sheet. They knew Paul's rap sheet. Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 58. It says that when they, so, when they stoned Stephen, Paul held their coats in agreement. Right? Acts chapter 22, verse 20. Paul admits to it. He says, I was in complete agreement with your witness. Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats while, and while they stoned him. Paul said that. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Paul was uttering threats to kill anybody who served the Lord. Right. And then even at the, at the end of his life in first Timothy 15, uh, one, verse 15, he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Um, everyone should accept it. Uh, Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners who I am chief. Paul says, look, I'm the, he was like, I'm the chief sinner. You have to uh, make um, you have to be able to forgive yourself, make amends with yourself. But in order to do that, you have to acknowledge the fact that you had you, you transgress God. You have to acknowledge the fact that you messed up. Right. As a parent, one of the one, one of the one of the worst things ever is uh, the know that I have to punish my child simply because she won't just admit that she did it. You know, she did it. You're, you're a parent. You know, your child, better than your child knows themselves. God knows. And, and, and for the person who's struggling now, please understand that God knew that you would struggle when he put a purpose in you. So there's no point in hiding from him. The psalmist said, David said in Psalm 139, after he sinned, after David sinned with Bathsheba, David said, Lord, he said, you form my innermost being. You know me in and out. I can't even hide from you if I wanted to. Right? So God knows that we got, we're, he, he, know, he knows. We had a purpose before we had a name. But in the process of all of that, he understood that you're, you're going to have struggles. So you might as well just own up to them, confess them to him. He already knows anyway. But that confession is what liberates you. That confession is what brings you out. That confession is what says, Lord, it, it puts you in a, in a place of humility, right? Because it says, okay, Lord, I know I have issues. And once he, once you confess that and he forgives you, now you need to forgive yourself. How do I forgive myself? First of all, I have to recognize the fact that I'm no longer that person anymore. Right? Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 12, I don't mean, I, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He says um, uh, in verse uh, 13, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race, uh, which is the prize in Christ. Okay, he says, look, I don't remember the past. I'm not going to stare. I'm not going to look back there. I'm just going to press. Right? I'm just going to look forward. I ran track a long time ago. Right? One of the things that would slow you down, right, is, uh, and especially in the relay races, the relay races, uh, especially the, the sprint relay, when the stick came around the track, you just had to, when, they, when, your, when your teammates had a stick, you had to put your hand back and get the stick to take off running, right? It would slow you down if you turned around to look for the stick. You'd lose time. The same thing happens in our spiritual walk. We get slowed down by looking behind us. And so, and so, and so if I could, if I could just help you a little bit, David said in Psalms 23, that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I don't have to look back here. I don't have to worry about what's back there because goodness and mercy are following me. I just have to look forward. Okay. And so 
How do I forgive myself? First thing is you need to look forward, all right? Second thing is you can't focus on what they heard. You have an assignment, all right? Now, remember Acts chapter 9, when God said, told Ananias that Paul, Saul was coming, and Ananias, the first thing he says, I've heard many people talk about it. You can't focus on what they've heard, right? Some things they heard were a lie. Some things they heard were true, but you can't focus on what they heard, right? God told him that Saul was coming, and the first thing Ananias said was, wait a minute, I heard some drama about him. This is what I found out. A few reasons why people can't receive you as who God says you are. Um, uh, um, first of all, you can't change what people have heard. You can't change how they respond to what they've heard. What they think of you is none of your business. What I found out is the people that are overly obsessed with your past, they're really unfulfilled in their present. So it's not even about you. These are just bitter, miserable people, unhappy about their presence. And they're looking for a way to bring somebody else down. But what they think about you is none of your business. Remember, I told you on Monday, First Thessalonians 4 and 11, uh, study to be quiet and mind your own business. Right. So what people think about me is not my business. So I should be minding it because if I allow their opinions to dictate how I feel about myself, then I'm going to let their uh, I'm going to let their um, uh, I'm going to let their uh, criticisms keep me from moving forward. Nobody should have that kind of power and authority over your life. But God. Paul said in Galatians 1 and 10, obviously, if pleasing people were my goal, I wouldn't be a servant of God. Meaning I'm not here to impress you. I'm not here to serve you. You don't have to like the reason why I'm here. You don't even have to like where I came from, but you will respect my anointing. If not, then I'm going to dust the, dust the dirt off my feet and I'm going to move on, right? But I'm, what I'm not going to do is waste time arguing about you, arguing with you about who I am. That's valuable time. Valuable time, Okay. As long as you're concerned with what they heard, you'll be too preoccupied to hear him, to hear what he wants you to hear. All right? You're ear hustling, trying to find out what they're saying about you. Meanwhile, God's trying to send the spirit to, to speak to you, but you can't hear the spirit because you're too busy trying to hear what they have to say. Okay. All right. If you read through chapter nine, you'll notice Ananias said, I've heard these things about him. Paul shows up and there's not one time in Acts chapter nine where Paul spends addressing what they heard. Not one time does Paul spend discussing anybody want to talk about my past? Anybody wants some clarity? Right? You know, you don't owe anybody an explanation. God saved you. He delivered you. He set you free. That's all they need to know. Now, you may be prompted by the Holy Spirit to give your testimony. That's one thing. But you don't owe anybody anything except for God himself. All right? So number one, um, uh, you got to be able to uh, forgive yourself, right? How, how do I how do I forgive myself? Look forward. Number two, how do I how do I uh, forgive myself? You can't be overly concerned with what they think. That's the, what they think about you is just none of your business, okay? Number three, you have a responsibility to go to work immediately, okay? Now look, Acts chapter nine, uh, verse seventeen, Ananias laid hands on Paul. The the blinders came off his eyes, and um, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And verse twenty, uh, verse nineteen says he ate some food. <laughs> yeah, he. Verse 20 says, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, right? Immediately. When God touches you and he tells you your past is quite clean, you have to immediately get up and start working, okay? Now, some of us have paused right here. And I believe that this, the word for word of life this, this year is reset. I believe this is your moment of reset, right? This is your moment to say, okay, reset. I'm going to work immediately. Why? Because the last time when God said, go to work, I stalled a little bit. And I stalled because I'm like, eh, am I really qualified? I don't have any degrees. I, I'm not a preacher. Ah, I stalled because I don't really know the scriptures like somebody else does and all that kind of stuff. And so, and so here, and so what happens is, what happens is you start to uh, allow time um, to be filled with the doubt and insecurity. And so now here it is, you've, you've forgiven yourself. You, you're, you're looking forward. You're no longer concerned with what they have to say, but you've fallen into this time trap where you where you've allowed time to get in the way of the call. You have, and, and one thing when I when I used to sell cars back in the day, we were trained to make sure that and it's it's, a, it's such a horrible practice. But I was trying to feed my family, okay. And I'm saying we're selling Audis and all that kind of stuff. And you wanted to get the impulse buyer. You wanted the one that didn't have to think about it, just sign the paperwork real quick because that was an easy commission, right? Now. Obviously, not everybody did that. Some people said, oh, I got to think about it. Let me go talk to my wife and all that kind of stuff. We knew that if they left the desk, that nine times out of 10, they weren't coming back. Because time and distance will allow their mind to start to think about other things. Well, this is what happened spiritually. Uh, God forgave you and he called you. You answered the call. You forgave yourself. You said, I'm moving forward. 
I'm not concerned what they have to say, but you didn't get to work immediately. And you allowed time and distance to start to infiltrate your mind and build insecurity and doubt and fear. You started to question if you were qualified, if you were worthy. You started to wonder if your past was really too great for you to overcome. You started listening to other voices of people. You started comparing yourselves to people that, that, that were called to do the same thing that you had. Right? And then people started telling you that you weren't worthy. They started to shun you, make you feel like you were by yourself. You started doubting yourself, and then you start to take a step backwards. Thank God for grace. Because today is the day where you can say, you know what? You're right. I did allow time to separate me from my, my fire. Um, but today, I'm, I'm going to jump back in this thing. Now, if that's you, immediately get to work. Meaning, as soon as you stop watching this, seek God about what he wants you to do today. This day does not belong to you. It belongs to him. And so your job is to say, okay, God, I have 24 hours in this day. How can I impact the kingdom? Immediately get to work. It doesn't have to be on a Sunday morning preaching. It could be your coworker who just needs prayer. It could be the homeless person that just needs a blanket. Just immediately get to work, okay? All right, so. Verse 22, chapter 9, Acts. Saul's preaching. Now, when I say Saul's preaching, let's just say... Um, take the emphasis off of preaching and just put it on serving. And let's take Saul's name out of it and put uh, Sister Johnson's name. I just read a random name. Sister Johnson's serving became more and more powerful. <laughs> Let me go back to 21. <laughs> Verse 21. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused devastation among the Jews? Our uh, Jesus followers in Jerusalem. And did he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Verse 22 says, after hearing this, his preaching became more and more powerful. It became more and more powerful. See, this is where you have to have some type of resolve. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, be steadfast and movable, always abounding, always looking for more ways to serve the Lord. Be steadfast, be sedentary. Uh, like a tree planted by the water. I'm not going to be moved. I don't care what comes my way. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, be a move, be steadfast. I mean, feet just locked in. I move. My mind is made up. <sighs> because when you get to work immediately, they're going to start talking immediately. When you get to work immediately, they're going to start gossiping immediately. When it gets to work, when you get to work immediately, Satan's going to try and play with your mind immediately. Paul said the solution to that is, verse 22, let your serving become more and more powerful. Isn't that something? Most of us get punched and we kind of back off a little bit. Paul got punched and he said, I'm going to go even harder for the Lord. That's what intimidates Satan right there. The fact that I'm, I'm sending people your way to talk about you. I'm sending people your way to make you feel insecure about yourself. I'm sending people your way to make you feel like you're not worthy to be called. You ain't nobody. Um, you know, forget your title. I know who you really are. All that kind of stuff. And you have the audacity to get more and more powerful in your service. Help me, Holy Ghost, right? That's where, that's where you need the Holy Ghost because, because when you feel like throwing it a towel, if you just stir that thing a little bit, you'll get a little bit more strength, a little bit more power, right? Okay, so finally, here's my last point. <laughs> I need you to understand this. Verse 23, chapter nine, after a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. I need you to understand this. That which they can't stop, they will attempt to kill. Now we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Ephesians 6 lets us know. Understand this, that Satan says this. I'm going to try and stop you. If I can't stop you, I'm going to attempt. I'm going to try I'm gonna make a plot to kill you. I sat in a hospital bed for five days as a result of one of Satan's plots. He sent everything but the kitchen sink at me this last couple of years. And he said, okay, every time I hit him, he bounces back. Every time I knock the wind out of him, the Lord gives him his breath back. Okay. All right. I got something big. Understand this, that it may not even be a physical attempt to kill you, but it could be an attempt to kill your ministry. It could be an attempt just to kill and stop your ministry in its tracks. And by ministry, I don't mean preaching. I mean, assignment, whatever God called you to do. 
we weren't all called to pastor. We weren't all called to get in the pulpit and preach. We weren't all called to sing and all that, but we are all called to do something. And when we get into gifts and spiritual gifts, I think maybe we'll just, we'll just tackle that because we've all been called to do something. And Satan says that, Satan says this, you're, you're dangerous now because you go from not knowing God and doing everything contrary to God to knowing God. And then once you get to know God, you understand what forgiveness looks like. And you realize that I can't move forward until I forgive myself. So then you make amends, you forgive yourself and you say, I'm not going to look behind me anymore because my past is covered. Grace and mercy are back there. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to keep my mind focused on the cross. I'm not going to allow the opinions of people to sway me. And then when they do try to sway me, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep going. And, and, and even when, and even when it seems like their opposition and, and, and their ability to bring up a past gets stronger, I'm going to get stronger in serving in my assignment. And Satan says, wow, she got to go. Except verse 23 says, after a while, chapter nine, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. Imagine how much of a threat you must be for Satan to have his eyes on you to kill you. I often say that if he's not messing with you, it's because he has you, right? <laughs> but, but if you feel like Satan has been after you, if you feel like every time you try to commit to something that the Lord has called you to do, Satan just throws it all at you. Satan tries everything. That means he sees you as the ultimate threat. Imagine that you're walking away because you just can't take the heat and you actually let Satan off the hood. Satan's like, I'm glad I got rid of that one, man. Why don't this season, why don't we turn the heat up on Satan and let him know that we're not going anywhere? You can huff and you can puff, but you won't blow this ministry down, right? Look at this, Isaiah 54, 17. We quote this scripture isolated. And I think we don't do it justice by reading the next scripture. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's what we shout. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. That's what we shout. But this scripture does not apply to everyone. Look at the next verse. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness for me, says the Lord. Benefit of being a servant of the Lord is you can declare that because I'm a servant of the Lord, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment. What does that mean? Every person who puts their mouth on you because they know your past and they know your struggles. And they try to use that to disqualify you from something that God calls you to, not them, shall be condemned because you're a servant of the Lord. Happy Wednesday. Listen, forgive yourself and serve the Lord with everything that you have. Don't pay attention to anything they have to say. Most of those people are just miserable within themselves anyway. Pray for them and move forward. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for meeting us here. God, we thank you for those that listen live and those who will watch later. And we pray that they take something from here as a seed to spring forth a harvest in their personal ministries, wherever they serve. And God, we just thank you because everything we do is for your glory. And it's only our desire to impact the kingdom of God. And we give you glory, honor, and praise, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, I'll see you all on Monday, okay? Unless the Lord tells me to get back here on Friday. But if he doesn't say so, I'll see you all on Monday, all right? Grace and peace to you. Um, love you. All right.